Okay, welcome back. The demo that I'm going to do now is going to be a really good physics problem. I'm going to have a frictionless surface here, air going through this air track. Then I have here this glider, and then on top of this glider, an incline. And so my question is going to be, I'm going to have an object on top of that. This object is going to be riding on top of this, and then I'm going to make it slide down while the air is on. And then so as this thing slides down, this thing is going to go back. And so I'm going to be asking, what is the acceleration of this object as it's sliding down the ramp? And what is the acceleration of the, the incline playing backwards, right? So if I turn the air on, you can see what I mean. Right, so if I allow this to fall, you see how the, the block slides down, but the other one slides the other way, right? Okay, so let's do the math of that. The, the glider with the, together with the incline, right? I'll call here, and then this one block. So together, the incline and the glider, I'll just call that big M, right? Uh, big M, and then you got this block here, little m, right? And then this is angle theta, right? So the little m is accelerating down the incline, We'll call this one A2, right? With, with res that's the acceleration of the block with respect to the incline, uh, right? And then the incline uh, together with the glider is accelerating back at an acceleration of A1, right? So then what's the physics of this? Let's do the free body diagram. For the falling block, we have here the normal force N, right? And then we have here, uh, the acceleration is down the incline, but the block, the falling block is just also accelerating to the left because it's also riding on top of this, right? So as this one is going down and then the, block, and the, the incline is going to the left, the block is, has two accelerations. It has an acceleration with respect to the incline, right, A2, but because the incline is going this way, it also has an acceleration A, A1 that way, right? So it's accelerating this way, A1, right? So it's got two accelerations. Then you got here Mg. So I'm gonna assume all uh, surfaces are frictionless, right? Now for the incline, what are the, uh, what is the free body diagram? For the incline together with the glider, we got big M, right? We got the normal force of the surface pushing on it, right? Uh, we can call that N prime. We got here big M G, right? And because the incline is supporting the block this way with a force N, the block in turn pushes the incline down this way, right? With a force N, okay? So uh, let's see, for the, the incline, the acceleration is gonna be to the left only, A1, right? So the, for the incline, the only thing important that is happening is in the x direction. In the y direction, nothing is important is happening. So we can take the normal force, right? If this is theta, this is gonna be theta. So we can break the normal force into components and we can say this is n cosine theta. But n cosine theta doesn't really do much. It pushes the block, uh, it pushes the incline downward and just increases the effective weight of it. But since we're ignoring the friction on the incline, that's gonna do nothing, right? So the only thing that's doing anything is the, the x component, which is n sine of theta, right? So we can say n sine of theta on the incline is gonna be equal to big M, big M times A1, right? So that's gonna be the acceleration of the incline uh, together with the glider, right? N sine theta is MA1. That's the only force that is necessary that is playing a certain important role on the incline plane, right? Now for this one, there's more stuff happening, right? What I, for usually in, in uh, Newton's law questions, we usually break the mg into components, this way, this way. But since the acceleration is, it has, is in the horizontal direction, I believe for this case, it's better to break the forces with this way, along this way, and then to break the A2 into its two directions, right? So we can say here, this is uh, theta, this is A2 cosine theta, and then this is A2 sine of theta, right? This way and this way, and then break the normal force into components, 
we have here, this is theta, this one is going to be n cosine theta, this one is going to be n sine theta, right? So then we're going to say, okay, the dominant acceleration of the block is the a2 cosine theta, right? So we're going to say here, n sine theta, which is this way, n sine theta, it's in the positive x direction this way, right? Is there any other force? No, nothing else, right? No other force in the x direction. So that n sine theta is equal to the mass of it, little m, okay, times the acceleration that way, a2 cosine theta, right? But it also has an acceleration because it's riding on the incline, it also has an acceleration back. So minus m a1, right? So that's little m, okay? <clears throat> so n sine theta is m a2 cosine theta minus m a1. Right now, how about in the vertical direction? Well, it's accelerating also downward, right? A2 sine theta, so that means mg has to be larger than n cosine theta. The weight of it has to be larger than the x component because the weight of it has to beat the n cosine theta in order for it to accelerate down. So we're going to say mg minus n cos theta is equal to little m, okay, times uh, a2 sine theta, a2 sine theta, okay? So now we've got three equations, right? n sine theta, m a1, so what are my unknowns? What are my unknowns? My unknowns is n, okay? My other unknown is a1, and then my other unknown is a2, okay? Which of these am I interested in? Well, I'm primarily interested in A1 and A2, right? The N is not as relevant for me. But what I could do is combine these equations together, derive an equation for A1, and then once I derive an equation for A1, then I can derive an equation for A2, and then those are the ones that are important, right? So let's see here what's gonna happen, okay? So how do we put these together? Then what I can do is I can notice all of a sudden this is N sine theta, Right? That's equal to big M A1, and then sine theta is equal to that. So I can just say N sine theta is big M A1, put it here. Big M A1 is equal to little m A2 cosine theta minus little m A1. Okay? So what does that mean? Well, that will give me an equation relating A1 and A2. That's perfect. Right? So I can bring this one over here, I can say A1 big M plus little m is equal to m a2 cosine theta, then it's going to be a1 is equal to uh, little m a2 cosine theta divided by big M plus little m, okay? I could take this here, little mg minus, and where you see the n, I can substitute n is big M a1 over sine theta. Right? I can substitute that there, but then I'll still have the cosine theta, right? So I'll have big N A1 over sine theta. Then I have here cosine theta, right? That's equal to little m A2 sine theta, okay? So then I can erase this because I've already utilized that equation, okay? So I could multiply here everything by sine. I can get a little mg. What can I do? Then I can put this relationship. A1 is equal to ma2, right? So mg sine theta minus m cosine theta. And then for A1, I can substitute this. Little m a2 cosine theta over big M plus little m. That's equal to m little m a2 sine theta. When I multiplied everything by sine, this is mg sine, this one disappears, this should be sine squared theta, right? Sine squared theta. So then uh, that becomes positive, right? So then what, the next step is gonna be what? Okay, then I can multiply this, get a common denominator, I can say mg sine theta is equal to a2, uh, cross multiply here, so we're going to be mg sine of theta a2, so you have here uh, big M, little m, right? And then sine squared plus cosine squared is uh, 1, so that's gone. 
plus little m squared sine squared theta over big M plus little m. Uh, the next step that we're going to do, we're going to cancel the little m with this little m and with this one, right? And then we can take everything to the other side, cross multiply, and then we'll get an expression for A2. A2 is going to be big M plus little m, right, times G sine theta. So that's going to be our expression for A2. Now we can come up for an equation for A1, the acceleration of the incline with the, together with the glider. M sine squared theta, right? And then the M plus M cancels, right? And then I get here uh, A1 is equal to MG cosine theta sine theta becomes sine of 2 theta over 2, right? Sine of 2 theta over 2. Then big M plus little m sine squared theta, right? If I want, I can take the little m and divide it into here. And then I can just write it as um, this becomes just one big M over little m, okay? Go, uh, the glider with together with the incline weighed in at 213 grams. The big M was uh, 213 grams, okay? And then my little m, I already measured the mass of this one, okay? That one came out to be 44 grams. Okay, 44 grams, okay? And then uh, my angle is a 30 degree angle. The angle of inclination of this incline is a 30 degree angle. So then I'm gonna put all of those in, calculate what, uh, what my expected A1 and A2 are, right? A1 is gonna be, so since the, the, the glider and the incline plane are quite a lot heavier than the block, the acceleration of the, the together, the glider and the incline plane is gonna be small. It's not gonna to be too uh, large. If their masses were similar, let's say big M was the same as little m, what would happen? Then this would be a ratio of one. The acceleration would be a lot bigger, right? If they had the same mass. It would be one plus sine squared 30, 9.8 sine of 60 over two. So, so it will be, uh, well, let's actually calculate what that will be if they were the same mass. And the, the backwards acceleration is very fast, right? Now, of course, if the, the top one was heavier, right? If the little m was actually bigger, then the acceleration is gonna be even more, right? So you can keep making this acceleration more and more, right? By making the, uh, the block heavier than the actual incline and glider, right? So now if A1 is 0.83 in my case, what is A2 gonna be, right? Well, we can say A2 is gonna be six meters per second squared. Okay, the way I can run this demo and see if this is working is I can measure the distance from the top of the incline to the bottom and I can say, okay, if this is starting from the top of the incline, how many seconds will it take to fall off, right, right this, right? What's the distance from here to here? How many seconds uh, will it take? During that time, what's the acceleration of the, the block gonna be? The block, the incline and the glider, right? And then how, what should the speed be? So we can do an actual demo and check this and see if it's working, okay? So uh, the distance from here to here, so it's gonna be like this. This is gonna start here, and then by the time it basically falls off completely, right? It has traveled the same distance as the length of the incline. So the length of the incline is gonna be 11.7 centimeters four seconds 0 0.204 seconds that's like 204 milliseconds so by the time I put it and then I turn on the air release it it's gonna be down all, all of a sudden it's gonna go down in 200, 200 milliseconds right very quickly now during that time what's gonna be the velocity of the glider and the incline plane what's gonna be the velocity how much velocity will they have picked up right so uh, we know that the acceleration A1 is equal to 0.83 meters per second squared. What is the equation? The velocity of the incline together with the glider is gonna be V initial plus A1T, right? What is A1? 0.83 meters per second squared, and the time is 0.204. That means, so then if I release it at the uh, halfway mark, there's a, a ruler here on my glider, See, 
I've already leveled the uh, air track, so it's pretty much even. So I will release it somewhere here. When the block goes off, the edge of the glider will be at the 82 centimeter mark, and it's going to travel all the way to 2 centimeters. So the total distance traveled by the glider is 80 centimeters. So then I'll start my uh, stopwatch. Ready, set. this ready set go okay so let's see how long it takes for it to go over there okay to six okay so the best the best way to do this of course is do it repeated times Right, as many times as you can, get an average value. So then what is the experimental velocity? The glider has traveled 80 centimeters during that time, right? So that's 0.8 over uh, 6.97. 0.8 divided by 6.97. That gives me 0.115 meters per second, okay? 0.115 meters per second. So you can see this is slower than the velocity expected from theory, right? So 0.1696 meters per second uh, was faster, why? Well, because there's some friction here. No surface is completely frictionless. If I had just used my first run, I would have gotten 0.8 divided by 6.39. So 0.8 divided by 6.39, that's going to be 0.125 meters per second, okay? Well, even that would have been uh, slower than the theoretical, right? So again, even if you do this several times, you're never going to completely eliminate the friction, right? So the result isn't going to be perfect, but you can see it is, it is definitely in the ballpark. So it's a really good experiment that you can do, right? Put different gliders, put different masses on that object, uh, calculate what their predicted accelerations are, right? And what their predicted final velocity, make, uh, make this run and see what your result is, okay? Thank you very much.